This is An American Workplace, a podcast dedicated to re-watching and discussing NBC's beloved mockumentary series, The Office. My name is Katie White, and joining me as always is my good friend and co-host, Chad Hopkins. Hello again after a little siesta. That's not the right word. A little break, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've had a few siestas since the last time we recorded, so you're yeah. not wrong. But <laughs> yeah, sorry, everybody. It was my fault that we did not record last week. We were going to record on Halloween. And uh, last week was just a tough week. There were a couple of 13-hour work days in my schedule last week. And so I, I needed a little bit of extra TLC at home. And so we just didn't get around to it. Totally uh, understandable. It was a crazy week for me, too. Fall just kind of is rolling this year. It's, uh, it's a busy one, which is, which is good. Um, full of good things. But yeah, yeah, things are nuts. So thanks for your patience, everyone. For photography, I actually was listening to another podcast earlier today, and he does some photography side work, uh, one of the co-hosts, and he said, hmm. it's photo season at the moment. And yeah. that makes sense with uh, the turn of the leaves and all that kind of stuff happening right now. I'm assuming it's that way in New York as well. Yeah, we've had some, I mean, seriously beautiful leaves and stuff right now. It's, uh, it's, I think it's the best fall I've seen since I've been up here. Um, and then it'll be six months of nothing photography wise <laughs> as we freeze our butts off. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be, I'm just trying to cram it in now while I, uh, while I can. Well, getting into podcast business, we have several people to thank this week. We had a couple of days where we just got a lot of contact and it was really super awesome. Um, so starting off on Apple Podcasts, we have a couple new reviews from Brayden and Roland. And on Facebook, we got a new recommendation from, it's either Neil or Niall. I think it's Niall. I sure. have a friend named Niall like this. Gotcha. I, I mean, I know there's the One Direction guy, but he has two L's, and I don't know if that affects the vowel. <laughs> so, uh, okay, maybe. Uh, yeah. But it, either way, either way. Uh, we also got several emails from QRust2002, Carter, Greg, Joe, Leslie, Sierra, and Jesus. So thank you all for reaching out. It's always nice to get uh, some mail and be able to interact with you guys outside of um, just the main show. Right. Not to mention there were several from Twitter as well. Just some like casual mentions. We love interacting with you guys on Twitter. Uh, so reach out to us there because that's probably where the two of us are most active anyways. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So moving into our first episode of discussion today, Happy Hour. It aired on March 25th, 2010. It was directed by Matt Sohn, written by BJ Novak. In an effort to hang out with Matt from the warehouse without the pressure of asking him on a date... Oscar arranges Oscar arranges an office slash warehouse happy hour event where they go to a local place called Sid and Dexter's uh, for drinks and billiards and arcade games. Pam rejoins everyone to get some time with some non-baby company, and she brings along a friend, Julie, who she thinks might get along with Michael, and she does, until Michael realizes it's a date and ruins everything. Meanwhile, Dwight and Isabel continue to make moves at each other despite Dwight's contract with Angela to have a child. And Andy and Aaron try to hide their relationship from the rest of the office because Andy hates drama. <laughs> and that's it. Clearly. He clearly hates it. So quite a few storylines going on here. Kind of difficult to know where to start on this. But let's, well, let's just, just start, start with, with Oscar. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> he is sort of the one to, to catalyst this whole situation. So Oscar comes in really early. He comes in at seven, two hours before he needs to be at work, just to cross paths with Matt and to, I don't know. Yeah, he, he doesn't really get to see Matt outside of happenstance. Um, and so he kind of made happenstance happen. Oscar <laughs> tries to ask Matt out, but Matt says, yeah, if you hear of anything going on, let me know. It's like, well. That's sort of what I was doing, was wondering if you had anything going on tonight, <laughs> because I'm trying to ask you out. And so Oscar did find something to do that night. He kind of arranged this, this happy hour, and kind of made it really obvious, because he was first asking the warehouse, as in, he never hangs out with the warehouse. Why else would he be doing this? So it was really clear mm -hmm. to Daryl what was going on. It was funny to me that Oscar was like, yeah, we, we talked this morning and we, we talked on Christmas. So a little momentum there. And keep in mind, this is 
probably around April sometime because we had St. Patrick's Day just a, a couple of days ago, and I think that's March 25th, if I remember that date correctly. Uh, so we're in April-ish right now, maybe even pushing towards May. And so Oscar's just glad that they've talked twice <laughs> over the last five months. A lot of momentum going there. And so he he talks with Daryl. I mean, I love how Oscar's trying to sort of beat around the bush with Daryl, trying to be sort of subtle in whatever way he sees himself being subtle. And Daryl's direct and to the point. He says, listen, talk straight with me. You can be gay with Matt, but talk straight <laughs> with me and be straight with me. <laughs> just tell me what you want. And Oscar just sort of shirks it off and uh, walks away. But it, it, it's funny that he is trying to be so sort of around again beating around the bush for this then when the event comes and they're all there oscar is sitting with the warehouse people because he's waiting for matt to show up and he's so clearly uncomfortable daryl's telling a story about some guy he was talking to about a uh what did he call it a a, a deck or a patio he says the guy shows me the deck he's built i'm like if this, i'll call this a deck if i'll it'll make you happy but it's just a porch without a roof and so all the warehouse guys laugh at this story. Ha ha ha. Building humor, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and Oscar's like, what's funny about that? I don't get it. I'm just going to take a sip of my beer and pretend I know what's happening. And so he's sitting there the whole night watching his office friends come in and sitting with the warehouse guys uncomfortable. And Matt just doesn't show up. It's pretty painful. You can see how uncomfortable Oscar is. and. We don't see Matt for the rest of the episode until the very end. Daryl is just in the middle of telling Oscar that, hey, Matt's a nice guy, but he's not very bright. And he and Oscar don't have much in common. Oscar is just on the verge of accepting this information and this kind of realization. And Matt walks in. Um, Oscar just immediately brightens up and goes to play basketball, this basketball arcade game with Matt. and. Um, again it's just not oscar it's totally out of character he's not uh, some jock like matt is but uh, yeah he'll he'll be out of his comfort zone it's probably diplomatic to say that oscar attempts to play basketball like, yes yeah <laughs> he, he's not very successful but he's making an effort uh but like you said D daryl points out that matt's he calls him a dummy and oscar is yeah. very clearly not a dummy and so really they don't have a whole lot in common not that intelligent people and unintelligent people can't be together i guess but oscar is very clearly into matt because he's a pretty boy so that's that story and that's what sort of sets up everything else and so i guess the the next logical step would be to go to jim and pam and then sort of by extension michael going to the beginning of jim and pam uh here andy invites jim out to happy hour and jim really doesn't want to go so he tries to excuse himself because of the baby and, and Pam hasn't seen anybody all day. And so let's go home. Um, Andy says, no, no, no. I mean, invite Pam. And Jim is sure that Pam does not want to go to happy hour with her <laughs> office mates. But Pam really wants a night out. I forget off the top of my head how old CC is at this point. But it's long enough that Pam has probably not seen anyone outside of like Jim and her mother for too long yeah. and i can imagine that you just need to talk to somebody um and so she's just so excited to go to happy hour um and takes andy up on this offer yeah it is funny how confident jim is that pam's not going to take him up on this he's like okay andy sure if it makes you happy i'm going to call her but she's going to just say what i just told you so whatever and then she she's like oh i am so excited i want to leave the house i want to interact with adults I want to not be changing a diaper for an evening. Like, come on, let's do this. And so they, they do end up going. And I hope this isn't like rude of me to say, but Pam, is it is it just me or is she like totally wearing mom clothes? Do you know what I mean you by know, that? No, I didn't notice. Like I didn't think of I don't that, know. but I'll it, have to go watch and see. And this isn't a slide against my mom either, but this is totally an outfit that my mom <laughs> would be wearing. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's, it doesn't look bad, there are but it's like really like mom clothes. They're just yeah, it's like, more practical. <laughs> it's 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 not an insult. It's just not the peak of young people fashion. So 
Right. <laughs> Pam Pam is achieving her next form, is basically what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyways, she decides to bring along uh, a couple of people, actually. She brings along Julie, who's a friend of hers, and she thinks that she's going to get along with Michael, and we'll get into that. <laughs> and then she also invites along Isabel. And so we'll talk more about Isabel in a second. We remember Isabel, of course, from uh, Niagara. She was one of her, the bridesmaids. And... Then she made an appearance a couple of episodes ago at the end of the delivery uh, because her and Dwight had a sort of thing going on. So Isabel's here as well. But Julie is the the main woman to talk about tonight. So let's start with her. Um, Pam chose to bring Julie along because, yes, she thought that she and Michael would get along, specifically because Julie laughs at every joke. Or attempt at a joke. (laughs) Or attempt at a joke. She's also very sweet, and she's pretty, and Michael will definitely like her because she laughs at every attempt at a joke, and she's not repulsive, so like those two things are kind of all it takes. And sure enough, he totally does, but only after, as you said kind of in your intro, only after he realizes it's a date. He's enjoying his time, he's enjoying spending time with Jim and Pam and Julie, but he doesn't really think twice about Julie until. Um, I forget if it's Jim or Pam says, hey, oh, no, it was, it was Jim. He says, hey, so Pam was right. You guys get along. So what do you mean? Well, you, you like Julie. And he just, oh, my gosh, I have to change everything. He runs, <laughs> literally, he runs to his car and changes his, his clothes. He takes off his tie. He, change, he puts on a hat, puts on a, an accent, <laughs> basically. Uh, and he calls himself Date Mike. Nice to meet me. Nice to meet me. He's just this. <laughs> Overly confident, like, I don't even quite know how to describe Date Mike, um, besides just obnoxious and far too confident and bro-y. Well, it's sort of like later in the episode, after things have been going down, and Mike was off talking to the manager of the place, Pam says, sorry, he's not usually like this. And Julie says, oh, what's he usually like? And they don't have an answer because he kind of is usually like this. It's just maybe to a more extreme version at the moment. And so really, Date Mike is just Michael with maybe less filters, less inhibitions, which is a scary thought. But that's what it is. And so we see it's such a stark contrast between uh, pre-knowledge of it being a date and post. Like at first, he's making her laugh. He's being perfectly normal. He's smooth. He's polite. She's charmed. She even has a talking head. She says, I was a little nervous when Pam told me he was her boss, but he doesn't act like a boss at all. If I had a boss like that, we'd never get anything done. Oh, how true those words are. Mm, No one does, Julie. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But then Date Mike shows up and he's no longer normal, funny, smooth or polite. She's no longer charmed. He's obnoxious. He tells us via talking head that he sort of got his dating tips and advice from all the reality TV shows he watches. Uh, And he's mostly learned from the losers, which doesn't make any logical sense to me. But really, if you're getting dating tips from reality TV shows in the first place, you're coming from a pretty bad place. It's probably even better to get dating tips from like a sitcom over reality TV, to be honest. You're right. He was kind of killing the date before he realized it was a date. Um, Doing really well. He knocks the tray out of the server's hand. He's swinging a pool cue around. This is Date Mike, of course. The the story really turns here when he climbs up on the pool table. So a manager uh, comes over and asks him to stop. He doesn't comply. Security is called and he's almost kicked out. He finally gets off the table and he's really embarrassed by, frankly, his own actions. But he's not embarrassed by his own actions. He's embarrassed by getting caught, basically. So he goes up to the manager, um, she's gone back to the bar or wherever she is, goes up to the manager and confronts her for calling him out. And so when she learns that he's a manager, he brings that up. For some reason, she like forgives his attitude and his actions and is curious about the book he's supposedly writing called Somehow I Manage. There will be a picture of him shrugging with his sleeves rolled up. And the manager intentionally picks Michael's name out of the lunch raffle fishbowl he put his business card in so thoughts on that interaction from you Uh, it is a pretty interesting turnaround um because 
well, first off, I the way Michael approaches her, this is how little self awareness he he has, or maybe it's a huge amount of self awareness. Either way, he says, "You embarrassed my friends in front of me." Right. So he's not apologizing for his actions. He's not owning up to how he behaved. He is pointing out to her, you embarrassed my friends in front of me. I'm here on a date. I'm here with my employees. And I I, I don't know if it's the fact that he's a manager that sort of makes her attitude change towards him, or if it's just like his, in a, wor- in a way, boldness. Like, mm-hmm. it's not boldness in a traditional sense, but I mean, he's to to put it plainly, he's got some balls going up to the manager mm-hmm. and demanding an apology for his stupid actions, you know? So maybe yeah. she just respects that about him is that he, he does have maybe lowered inhibitions and is, I, I just keep going back to the word bold, bold enough to approach her, the, the, if not the owner of this place, the person who's running things and d- make any sort of demands. So right. I-, I think it's that more than the manager thing, but I don't know. Yeah. So while he's talking to her and we don't know her name yet, so we're not going to use it. But while he's talking to the manager of this place, Julie ends up leaving because yeah, Jim and Pam can't say with good conscience that he's not usually like this in some capacity. So Michael's story in this episode ends with him having to set up a free lunch at some point with this manager person in the coming days. And so we will continue that in another episode. But before we finish on Michael, I wanted to go back to the very beginning of the episode when Andy first approaches him about this happy hour. He he goes to Michael and says, hey, some of us are going to go get some drinks. Do you want to join us? And Michael just gets that look on his face <laughs> that he gets like, oh, my God, it's happening like that, that face. And he says, OK, everybody, it is quitting time. <laughs> like Andy has to pause and say, no, no, not, not now. Af- after work, like we can finish what we're doing now and stay until we're supposed to work yeah, and yeah. be done. And then we go get drinks. And Michael's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. <laughs> but it's just funny to me. It's not even funny. It's it's almost kind of sad a little bit how excited he is for just such a simple thing. It's it's just drinks. Well, keep in mind, this is twice now in three episodes that he's been asked out to the bar. It's true. Although this is even more special because this isn't a, a holiday based around yeah. drinking. So this is just like true. casual work people hanging out after work and so it is a a big deal in his eyes absolutely we also have the aaron and andy little story here it's not super lengthy um aaron and andy think that they're being really secretive about their new relationship they've got a talking head about how it'll get complicated once everyone knows so they want to keep it a secret uh during this talking head kevin shows up behind them and starts making all these vulgar sexual gestures apparently they weren't being as secretive as they thought they were so now andy especially aaron wants to keep it quiet but really only because andy wants to so they're at happy hour and andy is now very careful not to spend too much time with aaron so he kind of spends the whole time just distancing himself from her and not being with her in order to preserve the secrecy of their relationship okay well now you don't really have one on this fun night out it's just it's counterintuitive or it's it's a what's the word ah you know what i mean (laughs) yeah yeah i mean he's trying to preserve the the secrecy of the relationship but in keeping each other separate and in making this such a priority he's sort of tearing the relationship apart for a moment Mm -hmm. like he's being so obsessive and extreme about this uh, there, they, it starts off at the place. They come up, and Ryan and Kelly are being adorable, actually, and dancing together yeah. while holding hands on DDR, which not really something I ever thought I'd say about Ryan and Kelly, but it's true. This one time, They're at being, least, it's true. They're being adorable. They have a good moment. And so Aaron and Andy start 
joking around with each other. Oh, what would everybody else say if they saw us dancing together like that? Oh, get a room, guys. Blah, 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 blah. When did, did we miss the wedding? Ha, ha, ha. And instead of, like, building on that playful back and forth and just, like, saying, screw it, let's do it, Andy says, I got it. I'm going to dance. You go do the racing game, and then we'll switch. So there's the first step in them not spending the evening together. And then they go to the bar or something they're walking around and i think it's actually phyllis comes up or something and set just as like hi to them and then andy says did you tell somebody she clearly knew and andy drags her into well into the bar area and says okay i know how to fix this so andy starts flirting with somebody at the bar and so aaron follows suit and andy doesn't like that very much and so that's not working he drags her into the photo booth and he starts yelling at her about how secret this relationship needs to be and how they need to try harder or whatever he gets the pictures and realizes that he's tearing things up ruin thing ruining things this fresh two weeks relationship however long it's been and uh he decides to take up the microphone so he he gets michael's job in this episode he gets the microphone <laughs> and announces to everybody we've been on two dates and there will probably be, probably be more and that's that it's out in the open that's their story this is how you date in 2010, apparently. <laughs> I would like to note that Andy's flirting was way more acceptable than Aaron's flirting. Uh, as yeah, she no like, was rubbing her hand up some guy's thigh and like, do you like it when I do that? And it's like, whoa, yeah, no, whoa, whoa, let's whoa. keep this G-rated. Yeah. Of course, sweet little baby Aaron has never had to um, flirt or never gotten to flirt, I don't know, in her whole life. Uh, so she really doesn't know how and comes off very sexual. <laughs> very sexual, not... like zero to 60. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't even flirting. That was just going for it. Right. And the last sort of characters we have to talk about are Dwight and Isabel and Angela a little bit too. Dwight is sitting with Angela at the bar. They're enjoying each other's company, talking. Remember, they have this whole sex contract thing where they're going to conceive and raise a child together. And then Isabel, who, as I mentioned earlier, was invited by Pam, shows up and she catches Dwight's attention and they start hanging out. We saw that they're having a good time together. They're talking. They're getting to know each other since they really hadn't done that up to this point. There was the night at the wedding where they slept together and then he ignored her the next day. And then there was a delivery where they had a brief interaction at the very end, expressed some interest. And now here they are finally getting the chance to actually like express interest in each other, like know each other. And the whole time, Angela is just like following along in the background as she's trying to attach herself to Dwight. And Angela is putting forth special effort tonight. She's got her hair down. She has bright red lipstick on she's clearly dressed for the occasion and dwight just isn't interested in her he's so focused on isabel um he even does a pro con list basically um angela versus isabel he says height advantage isabel birthing hips advantage isabel remaining childbearing years advantage isabel legal obligation advantage angela (laughs) like it's it's gross and it's, you know, you don't, don't compare women, but he's completely over Angela. He does not want to be with her. Um, there's this tall, leggy brunette who totally has his attention and Angela's the opposite of that. And he's completely shifted to the anti-Angela. Here she is and she likes him, but he has this obligation legally. He tries to get rid of the obligation, though. Him and Isabel are playing whack-a-mole together. And Angela comes up and she tries to insert herself into the game together. Oh, I can I can play too. And Dwight uses his old pet nickname for her, Monkey. But it turns into like a derogatory, insulting kind of name this time. Listen, Monkey, come over here. The adults are playing. Let's Let's say what needs to be said. This has run its course. We want different things. I want a big family, like a physically large family. And I'm not going to get that from you. So don't worry about it. You're out of the contract. It's dissolved. You can go home. You're good. So he is trying to push things along. Okay, I'm with Isabel now, or I'm interested in being with Isabel. Not interested in being with you. Go home. Well, Angela's not all that happy about that. Imagine that. Angela not happy about something. (sighs) Crazy. 
to to finish up Dwight after he's he tries to end things with Angela says the contract is null and void, it's dissolved, you're out of it, you're off the hook. As Dwight and Isabel are starting to leave, they're in the parking lot. Angela comes back out of nowhere. It's the first time we've seen her since the whack a mole part, and she, I guess, is a subpoena. Like, here's your you're being served basically. You can either honor our contract, or I'm going to see you in small claims court because we have a contract. And hey, bub, I'm not I'm not giving it up so easily. I'm interested in this. I want this. You signed. I signed. And so be ready to go to court over this. And so that that's how that ends. Uh, aside from Isabel whacking Angela on the forehead like a whack-a-mole <laughs> and then Isabel and Dwight kissing in the lot. So where this originally started, where Dwight was the one coming up with this idea to have a baby with Angela, um, very quickly now he's completely lost interest and even tried to nullify the contract. So his interest peaked and, and waned very quickly. Right. I, I think the highlight is that Dwight still wants a kid, but he has gone beyond only wanting a son or, well, I mean, we know he wants a son, but a child <laughs> and has now gone from, I want a child and a relationship. And I've actually found somebody who I want to pursue that with. So, mm-hmm. um, and she's more suitable for what Dwight wants for, from his kids anyways. One more character thing I wanted to mention, and I don't really know if it belongs in funny moments or this part, uh, character development, but it's sort of an inside scoop on the darker parts of Phyllis's life. We've already gotten some of these moments um, in the past, but Phyllis has a little talking head about going out. She says, yeah, I love going to bars with Bob. I tend to wear something low cut, get men to flirt with me, and Bob beats him up. I forget how much we've learned about Phyllis's um, past, about her, like, secret life. But this is another little plug in that, I don't know, she she likes to kind of have this playful yet violent experience with men outside of her relationship. It's just, it's odd. She likes Bob stepping up and defending her in some capacity. Yeah. One last character to mention, and it's not a character we ever learn a whole lot more about. I mean, he's around. I, I'll say that uh, without fear of spoiling anything. He's around, but this is pretty much his best scene in the whole series. And it's pretty great because we get Hide's life story. The first mention we have of Hide, we actually see him once or twice in the episode at the bar. But Daryl and Oscar are talking, and Daryl says, did you talk to Hide? Did you get his life story? It's pretty, he's a pretty great guy. And Oscar's like, well, I just couldn't understand a word he was saying. So at the end of the episode, we get Hide's life story complete with subtitles so you can understand everything. So through his very thick accent, he tells a story about how he, in Japan, was a heart surgeon. Number one, steady hand. (laughs) And I'm not going to do the whole thing in the accent because I think that would probably be very (laughs) offensive. But he had to give the Yakuza boss, the Yakuza is like the Japanese mafia, uh, surgery. But he accidentally killed him. And so he hid on a fishing boat and caught passage to America. And he was unable to speak English. He didn't have any food or money. Daryl hired him. And now Hide has a house, a car, and a new woman. Daryl saved his life. But here's his big secret. He killed the Yakuza boss on purpose. He's a good surgeon. The best. (laughs) (laughs) Such a an odd <laughs> scene, but I feel like it was something like that that they just wanted to plug into this episode or into the series for so long, and they just I don't know. Um, I, I don't know the genesis this for that. Really interesting actor. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was more of the actor kind of thing. If, if you listen in the commentary, I'll go ahead and mention this. B.J. Novak was talking about how they they found Hide. He'd been in a couple of other shows with these little one-liners. And so he was aware of his thick accent and just wanted, he thought it'd be funny to have this like thick accent character who nobody really pays attention to all of a sudden give his life story. And it's like the first time anybody's ever listened to it. So that's sort of the genesis of that, at least. And I do want to say uh, the actor's name is Hide. It's Hidetashi Imura. And he's on Facebook. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to go to Facebook, he accepts friend requests from everybody, from what I understand. So if you wanted to be friends with Hide from The Office, you can send him a friend request, which is pretty cool. I heard that on the commentary, but I didn't uh, go verify that. Did you check? 
I've seen it in like the office Facebook groups. Oh, that's crazy. That's so neat. Yeah. Well, fun. Go be, go be friends with you, Dave. Yeah. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. Okay. So funny moments. Let's dive into these a little bit. Um, so we've got the cold open. Michael uh, was doing some push-ups. He accomplished 25 push-ups. Sorry, 24 and one girl push-up. He says, he, he, he's so confident in, in his uh, number. He says that anyone who can do more than 24 and one girl push-up can go home early today. So um, he at first only offered his respect, but people weren't interested in that. So he upped the prize to going home early. Lots of people in the office try. Stanley is the last one left. Um, Michael thinks it's adorable that he's the last one left. He's going slowly, but he's determined, and he finishes it. Michael says, it's not fair. He's got all that weight to help him go down. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the down part is not the do. hard part. <laughs> that's, that's my favorite part of a push-up, is the down. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, I, I love that Stanley then stands up and he just goes excuse me as he gathers the stuff and just leaves like uh, ed oscar had his little talking head reset essentially what we have here is one of those stories where a mother lifts a car to save her baby <laughs> and then even before that <laughs> the stakes are that yeah high. the stakes are so high but before that jim only does 19 and i love that jim has the he feels the need to justify why he only did 19 he's like I, I had a hard workout this morning, okay? Like, I can normally do more push-ups than Michael, but I had a hard workout this morning. That's my excuse. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael talking with Julie before he becomes Date Mike, she says, I'm an ESL teacher. Michael says, see, I, I didn't think you could teach that. I thought that was something you were born with. What am I thinking right now? Julie says, I'm thinking, did you think I said ESP? <laughs> and he says, yeah, yeah, I feel like an idiot. But she laughs because she laughs at everything. And it's kind of a cute mistake because he's not being obnoxious about it. But e ESP, ESL, same thing. Same thing. Jim, back in the office, um, when he is so sure that Pam will not want to go out that night, he has a talking head where he says, I got to tell you, this baby is amazing. She gets me out of everything. And, and I love her. I also love her very much. <laughs> That's important. But mostly she gets me out of things. Dwight, I, I sort of mentioned this earlier, but talking with Angela about dissolving the contract, he says, I want a big family. She says, I could see myself enjoying that too. He says, no, I, I want a, a big family, tall, thick, big, physically big family. Uh, <laughs> thank you for specifying. Little bitty Angela. Uh, I don't see giving birth to many large shrews. No. So kind of tagging on to Michael's excitement about getting asked to go to the bar, um, Jim, Pam, and Julie are playing pool and they need a fourth. Uh, also, they're just trying to get Julie and, and Michael to hang out. So Jim says, Pam and I are going to go play pool. We need a fourth. Michael doesn't even listen to him. He says, sucks to be you. Jim says, would you like to be our fourth? And Michael is so taken aback. He's so excited by this. He just sobers up. His face just drops. And he says, that would be sublime. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm trying to remember. What was the other circumstance in a previous episode where he used the word sublime? I think it was um, when he's in New York at the shareholder meeting yeah, that's it i don't remember the context it was he, the it was something about after the, the limousine the ride yeah yeah he's talking to david david was the ride up here yeah. it was sublime. very very sublime <laughs> very very sublime that's what it was <laughs> andy at the beginning of the episode says aaron i need you to fax this and get me a confirmation pronto are you going later and she says sure if you are he says yes and then she says, talk to me that way again and I'll cut your hair off. So subtle. Just like shouting out <laughs> fake conversation to hide the real one, which you could just have quietly and nobody would care. No one would notice or care. No. Michael, or rather date Mike, tries to tie a knot in a cherry stem with his tongue. Um, he does not succeed. He chokes on it instead. <laughs> so then he spits it out, ties it in a knot with his hands and passes it off. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the impressive part, Mike. No, not impressive at all. 
uh, Kevin in this episode really shows off his maturity. Uh, the first one was when Andy and Aaron were having their talking head, uh, and they open the blinds and they see him making the rude gestures that you mentioned earlier. So there's that. And he's also laughing very childishly. And then at the event itself, when he first sees Pam, he approaches and he makes his uh, best approximation of baby crying sounds around Pam. And then he, the reason he's doing this, he tells us in a talking head, is because sometimes when a mother hears crying, it causes her breast to fill with milk and to leak out her shirt, right? And so that's what he's trying to intentionally do to Pam. Because it would be funny. And he does this on a couple of occasions when they first meet up. And then later in the episode, he like holds his head up to her breasts and makes wailing sounds. And it's awful and embarrassing. And Jim just says, what is happening? <laughs> but then at the very end of the episode, Kelly is leaving and she's actually crying. Because she seems to be very drunk, and she spilled her drink and didn't get a refill. And all of a sudden, Pam's just like, oh, yeah, we need to go home, Jim. (laughs) Because it happened. And you just see Kevin sort of fist pump in the background. Very mature. Dwight is really good at whack-a-mole. Isabel is very impressed. How did he get so good? And he says he got really good by whacking moles. How else would you get good at whack-a-mole? So, real life. Hands Obviously. on experience for Dwight. <laughs> uh, Stanley has put several of his business cards in the <laughs> fishbowl to get a free lunch. Unlucky for him, she's going straight for Michael's. And also something that was pointed out in the commentary, Stanley is sitting with two other women at the bar. Yeah. So more affairs. Because why, why not? not? Once you're already one in, just keep going. Well, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe nothing happens beyond just sitting with pretty women at the bar, but it's still not a thing you should be doing. You got a wife. Yeah. The manager who is uh, talking with Michael asks what his drink is. He says, grenadine, which is not a drink. (laughs) Do not just drink (laughs) grenadine. That's something you put in a cocktail. (laughs) That's like the... Grenadine's basically just sugar, right? Like, yeah, it's I'm like pretty? cherry juice and sugar. I don't think I'm not even sure that there's yeah. actual cherry juice in there. I think it's all artificial. But it's a it's a it's like a cherry flavored syrup. Don't have it alone. <laughs> no, no, mix it in with something. Yeah, you'll have a far better time. Uh, we get a great shot of Creed playing Dance Dance Revolution solo, and he's built up a crowd. And when we see the screen, he's getting all perfect. And so Creed is a dancing machine. Good yeah. for him. <laughs> Deleted scenes for this episode. Angela has a talking head about how she's all work at the office, but sometimes at night she likes to go out and let her hair down. Not literally, of course. <laughs> like, be reasonable. Be reasonable. Not literally. <laughs> also with Angela, upon entering happy hour, the bouncer, or whatever you would call him, doesn't need to see Angela's ID. She insists. That's the rule. That's the law. He says, no, really, you're fine. And she just keeps looking for it. She holds up the line, digging in her purse. It's okay. You're not 18. We believe you. And she's just insistent. Why is her ID so difficult to find? Like, that's a little bit concerning. Like, what if she had been pulled yeah, over for right. some reason? Like, a police officer is not going to nope. wait. Anyways, when they first get to Sid and Dexter's, uh, Michael says, you know, whose idea was this? Meredith says, it was Oscar. And he doesn't really believe her at first. And Oscar says, what? I, what's the big deal? What, what, why the surprise? Kevin says, because you're antisocial and a snob. And Oscar has his talking head. I'm, I'm not a snob. I, I hate the opera. Well, the Philadelphia opera. He says, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, only a snob would hate one specific opera company. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Aaron and Andy are walking into happy hour, and Andy sends Aaron in first. He'll enter in two minutes after her. Get over it, dude. Yeah, he's just awkwardly standing there at the entrance while the bouncer is waiting. Like, You coming in? Well, you're going to come in? or Julie asks Michael where he lives, and she says, oh, I like the middle school over in that area. And Michael says, well, the basketball team hasn't made the playoffs in three years since Coach Keenan left. (laughs) 
but the drama club is on fire. Did you see Bye Bye Birdie? So good. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of I find that endearing that. that Michael keeps tabs, but it's also kind of creepy because it's a guy who doesn't have any affiliation with this middle school, aside from the fact that he lives in the area. Creed approaches Oscar at the bar. He says, hey, good looking, buy a guy a drink. <laughs> and Oscar just silently turns away from him. So Creed goes to the woman next to Oscar, who we don't know, and says the same thing. And she does the same thing, <laughs> turns silently away. Creed's not getting any, any luck tonight. Nice try. Nice try. Jim and Pam are talking to Michael. You know, it was, it was going so well. Why did you have to change anything? Why date Mike? He says, going well doesn't seal the deal. Say, yes, it does. <laughs> and Jim says, okay, well, if you have to be a character, do you have any other characters? Michael says, a black guy. No, 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 thank you. He says, Michael Klump. Boom, boom, I'm fat. <laughs> and Jim says, you don't have the suit, so move on. What next? And then he mentions the Scranton Strangler. So it's our first mention of the Scranton Strangler since the delivery when Andy had it shown on the newspaper clipping that he was giving Cece uh, for her birthday. And then Michael has a talking head about, you know, I've been dating for over 30 years. I think I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I just wrote, sigh. <laughs> like... <laughs> That's that's a cl- a clear sign that you don't know what you're yeah. doing if you've been doing it for 30 years. Hopefully you're not. Yeah. <laughs> and then we get some uh insight to just the rest of the office kind of what they're up to. We see Meredith hustling some guys uh while she plays pool. That makes sense. She's probably a a, a shark. Um and then we see Kevin is pretty good at ski ball. <laughs> uh which is that makes sense. He's he's a gambler. He's he just seems like the kind of guy that would hang out at these places. So Yeah. Yeah. That's what everyone else has been up to. We did get a commentary on this episode. It had BJ Novak, Oscar, Angela, Matt Sohn, who was the director, and Brian Baumgartner. Oscar and Angela talk at the very beginning of the commentary about how sore they were the day after filming the push ups cold open. Because they had to keep doing push-ups until the camera sort of got to them in the shot. And they did like 20 takes. And so it was lots of push-ups for them. Brian didn't do any because he'd had like a separated shoulder and had a steroid injection just the day before they filmed this. And so he, if you look, he's just like on the ground and sort of flopping up and down with his upper body. <laughs> Which is appropriate for Kevin anyways, I think. Yeah. And then... They said John only had to do one push up because there's like one shot where it he's on push up 19 or whatever and he goes 19 and that's it that's the one push up he had to do for the the whole shoot but everyone else they like they didn't know if they would be in frame because mm-hmm. the cameras were just kind of roaming and so they just had to keep going. yeah they got their workout in <laughs> and then Leslie who plays Stanley his push ups look so good because they didn't give the full secret or I guess it kind of did. Uh, his push-ups look so good because they arranged this system of sorts that used cal- counterbalances. They they used they said the word anvils uh, to take the weight off of him, and so it was like I guess there was a hidden rope or something attached to his waist or upper body or something, and then weights over here, and so the weights would go up as he would go down, and then it would go back and forth. So they were doing their best to make Leslie's push-ups look really solid. Stanley's, to be clear. And they were. I'd never noticed anything. Me neither. I still didn't see anything when they pointed it out. But Yeah, that was cool. So the very last of Kevin's rude gestures in Aaron and Andy's talking head, I don't want to describe it too much, but it's <laughs> like the, the, the most sexual gesture of the, of the few. They were shocked that that made it on the air. Um, that had actually never aired on TV before. So, TV history. <laughs> now, this was in the commentary, but it wasn't like about the episode, but it was really funny. Brian, uh, apparently they recorded this on May 5th. And so Brian turns to Oscar in the commentary and says, Hey, Oscar, happy Cinco de Mayo. Mm. <laughs> and Oscar says... Uh, yeah, this is the kind of casual racism I deal with on a daily basis on this set. 
<laughs> it was so funny <laughs> that they were they were Blatant making racism. jokes about this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The Kevin crying at Pam's breasts thing was based on Rain Wilson doing this to Angela Kinsey, who plays Angela Martin, after she had her baby. Uh, thanks, Rain. That sucks. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Steve, so Steve Carell actually pitched that idea after the table read mm. um, based on Rain's actions. The, the name of the place, Sid and Dexter's, was named after Matt Stone's children, Sidney and Dexter. So that's cool. And BJ Novak told us that the episode was originally called Group Date, but then the title change was suggested by Justin Spitzer. He'd always wanted to produce or direct an episode that was called Happy Hour. And so that's how that happened. Mm -hmm. Sid and Dexter's is clearly a play on like Dave and Buster's or something. Mm -hmm. BJ wanted Angela to put on the super bright lipstick to make it obvious that she was going out to a bar and this is what people at bars wore. And See, look, I'm trying. They said that it never made it into the episode, but then as you watch, she definitely uh, is wearing some pretty bright lipstick. Um, mm -hmm. So that's her. That's her going out outfit. <laughs> Date Mike originally had different wardrobe changes, uh, but Steve said it should focus more on the character change than on the wardrobe change. And so that's why the only real difference is he takes off his tie and does a couple bone, uh, buttons to show some chest hair and then the, the hat. And that's the, the major thing is the hat. So Steve's idea for him not wearing, I think one of the suggestions was like a dragon shirt of some kind is something I think yeah, that was it said. Was a, it was a dragon shirt a la Ed Hardy. Um, yeah. mm. Very gaudy and loud. BJ said of Rain that when Rain thinks something's a little bit too, quote, broad, he grimaces, looks up at you and says hesitantly, I'll try one like that. And then he does it once, falls in love with it when it works, and does it every take. So BJ says Rain cannot resist getting a big laugh. And this is in reference to when Angela is kind of sneaking up behind uh, Isabel and Dwight, and he doesn't see Angela. And so he turns <laughs> around and she scares him and he just, blah, he just kind of <laughs> jumps out of his skin. He curses. It's so funny. Yeah. He didn't want to do that, but BJ was like, just try it just do it um and then he got a big laugh and he just loved it and he did it every take <laughs> it was also bj's idea so we're talking about that same moment that angela's face only be shown behind dwight and isabel walking along because they're tall angela's not so it was a, a an interesting shot to have angela just sort of walking around in the background with only her eyes or head visible um mm. we also learned that creed like very much wore himself out playing DDR. Like it took a yeah. few shots. Uh, there were several times during the night he was playing, I guess. And he was like exhausted. Like they kind of feared for his life a couple of times. And th they joked around about how if he had died on the office while playing DDR, it would have made a good story. Not that they wished it upon <laughs> him, but they, they just thought it'd make a, a good story. A good way to go out. They said, yeah, <laughs> And the last thing for me is completely unrelated to The Office and anything to do with The Office, but it was mentioned in the commentary and I thought it was really interesting. Apparently there are two men for every one woman in Alaska. So that's news. Um, they mentioned <laughs> that because of, um, and it's completely unrelated, but I just thought it was interesting and funny because they, uh, they mentioned that because of Michael's pairing with... Uh, Julie, that th that night, someone says the odds are good, but the goods are odd. Um, apparently, that's a phrase that originated in Alaska because there are two men for every one woman. So, oh, I know okay. we have at least one Alaskan <laughs> listener, so you'll have to uh, confirm that for us. But completely unrelated. <laughs> that was it for me. So, um, what's your discussion topic for this one? So we kind of already talked about it. I kind of spoiled it early, but if there was anything we didn't say or lengthen on here. What could it possibly be that the manager liked in Michael? He was acting like such a jerk, kind of yelling back at her, refusing to listen to her, or even just have decent manners in public. And it seems by the end, like she's flirting with him. Why? I'm looking at the office quotes page right now to see what is it that, where she turns. and. 
it seems that it's after he mentions the book that mm-hmm. she really turns, or maybe even when he says, it just so happens I'm a manager too. The way I manage my people is that I touch their hearts and souls with humor, with love, and maybe a dash of razzle dazzle. And I don't see that from you. And then she responds with, is that how you do it? And I wonder if that little speech about the 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 contrast in their managerial approach almost makes him seem insincere like in his anger like maybe he's maybe she perceives that he's sort of flirting with her like why else would this guy come up and and argue with me about this if not to try and get mm. something out of it you know so maybe she's like misreading his intentions and thinking that because Michael is such a goofball that he's actually trying to be funny with her and he's not completely serious about how he's a better manager than her and he's actually writing a book and all that kind of stuff, you know? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I wouldn't have pegged that. Um, but that, that, that could definitely be, uh, what's going on. I was thinking more along the lines of, um, the book, because I, I saw that shift at the same time when he, mentions the book i think the camera cuts to her and she kind of has this reaction of like oh just she she goes out of fight mode and into listening to him um and it, i think that was right after he mentioned the book and so i think she thinks that he's more successful than he is or he's like a big deal when we know that he's you know not a huge deal we love him but he's not a huge deal Um, right. But I think she just has this air of success around him that might not exist. I don't know. It's very confusing that that switch. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've already sort of hinted that she's, she comes back. I mean, it's not, that's not a huge surprise. I wouldn't think. So we'll explore that more as we go on to further episodes. Uh, but in the meantime, we've got secretary's day. It aired on April 22nd of 2010 was directed by Steve Carell. Forgive me if I'm misremembering. I think it's the third episode directed by him. And it was written by Mindy Kaling. So today is Secretary's Day. Andy has gone all out to make sure that Aaron feels appreciated. So Michael takes her out to lunch and accidentally ruins the entire day for her. He tells her that Andy and Angela were engaged, which of course Aaron did not know. Meanwhile, a mean video is going around making fun of Kevin, and Gabe uses this opportunity to exercise his authority over the office. Okay, real quick, before we move on, Steve Carell, this is his second episode to direct, but he wrote Casino Night and Survivor Man, and he directed Broke and Secretary's Day. So he's done two of so each at this point. Yeah, I, I combined something there. But anyways, so this is his second episode to direct. Andy is trying to be a good boyfriend. It is their three-week anniversary. How romantic. And it falls on Secretary mm. Day. Secretary's Day, lucky him. And he, to his Even credit, better. sarcasm aside, is trying to make it a special day for her. He has bombarded the entire rest of the office with texts, emails, voicemails, whatever else, to remind everybody, hey, it's Secretary's Day. I expect all of you to do something from my girlfriend because it's her special day. And so we see at the beginning of the episode, everybody does surprisingly listen to Andy, maybe to just stop getting text messages from him at seven in the morning. Uh, People bring in cards, chocolates. Dwight brings in a a basket full of beets. How thoughtful. (laughs) (laughs) But all of this goes to say that the focus for Andy and for Aaron is on Michael because Michael's the boss. She is technically the secretary for him in addition to being the secretary for all the office. And so Andy is really pushing Michael to try and make this a special day for her. Michael says, I'm going to give her $15. I think you should at least take her to lunch. Fine. I don't want to, but I will. He, he calls her, um, he calls her a rube or, a country bumpkin, which I looked that up um, because I wasn't sure what a rube meant, but which is funny because Dwight called Isabel a bumpkin in Niagara. So that's a favorite word of the writing staff. Um, (laughs) He finally agrees to 
take Aaron to lunch. He's completely disengaged the entire time. He wants to listen to his book in the car with her. Uh, he doesn't listen to her at lunch. He acts annoyed and bored the whole time. And poor Aaron is just so, she's so excited. She's so excited to be lunching with Michael. And she just wants to learn all about him. She has all of these questions prepared in case the conversation lags. I mean, she's just, they're weird. Don't get me wrong, but she's trying. Um, and we learn a lot about her in this episode. And we get to see, I think for the first time, her most weird self. We always knew that she was a little just odd, but in this episode, I mean, it's peak Aaron oddness. I, I don't really understand Michael's attitude towards Aaron. One, because it's been a while since Aaron's been around at this point. And she has, for a large part of that time, acted as Michael's sort of personal secretary, right? And they've been, I, I wouldn't say close and like, uh, we have a meaningful relationship kind of way, but they work together a lot. They've been around each other a lot. And not to mention Scott's Tots, where they had that sweet moment at the end where Michael had the same sort of, I don't want to spend the day with you, Aaron. I want to spend the day with Pam because she's a secretary I know and love. Even if she's not a secretary anymore, she's the one I want. She's a receptionist I want. But at the end of that episode, they have a sweet moment where they sing, hey, Mr. Scott, what you going to do together? And she comforts him in saying, hey, you helped the graduation rate go up. Whether you're going to pay for these kids' college or not, yeah, maybe that's an awful thing, but you help them to get to this point, which is good in its own respect. And now Michael is just completely disinterested. I don't know what the change is, but he is struggling until it gets onto the topic of not Aaron or not himself from all of her questions. And so it lands on Andy. So she says, I love Andy. I'm having a really good time with him. What can you tell me about Andy from before I knew him? And Michael. And being he's got a big one. Michael. <laughs> uh, what is it with Michael and breaking old relationships with people? He yeah. lets loose that Andy and Angela dated. Oh, but also they're engaged to each other. Oh, but also they slept with each other. And also she works four feet behind you and she freaks out yeah. <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> yeah. She has a little meltdown right there in the restaurant. That wouldn't be easy news to take for anyone, but Aaron just doesn't cope well with this news, with this information and basically breaks down and she puts her hair in front of her face and, I mean, that was, that's her room, she says. And that's it. That's lunch. She's done. Um, so Michael takes her home or takes her to the office. And um, when we get back to the office, Erin is, I mean, she's still visibly upset. She doesn't say anything. Andy has this whole Secretary's Day thing prepared. He makes a speech at the party that Angela threw, that Angela, of course, threw, and thanked and complimented Angela on the party. Right as Andy is about to sing Aaron a song that he wrote for her called Secretary of Love, Aaron throws cake in his face and tells him that she knows everything Michael told her so. So it's just, she just isn't, she's not handling this news well. It's awful, awful news for her to receive from her boss, not from her boyfriend. Pairing that with Andy preparing this whole day for her. Oh, and Angela helping because she's head of the party planning committee. It's just not a good day for Aaron. It's not a good combination. She demands the truth. She questions, who else in the office did you sleep with? So it's, it's trust issues. And <clears throat> when she talks with Andy later, she says, trust is the most important thing to me. Right? So this is my discussion topic, so I don't want to get it too into it right now. But I, I just don't understand the extent of the freakout. But maybe we can explore that again in a minute. Okay. She does have Angela kind of try to comfort her. She says, you're, you're wanting to throw up over the wrong reasons. Uh, Pam tries to comfort her, though that goes over her head. Pam says, you know, 
it's not about who you were with in the past. It's who you end up with. And Aaron's like, oh, well, you haven't found what you're looking for then. I, I hope you find what you're looking for <laughs> instead of trying to argue it. Pam just says, thank you. That, that's sweet. Thank you. And then finally, at the end of the episode, Michael, thank you, Michael. You do have some sense about you where he realizes the effect the news has on her. And so earlier in the party, when Andy started complimenting Angela, he tried to downplay it. Like, no, this is not the good time for you to be complimenting Angela right now. Take it from me. She's not that great. Read my mind. He can't. But he approaches Aaron outside on the bench and makes her feel good. Says, you know, in comparison to Angela, you are younger. She could be your mom. She's three feet tall. Uh, She probably has never pooped in her life. Like, just silly things to try and make Aaron laugh, and he's successful. She does laugh. She does relax a little bit. So it's nice that Michael does try to make amends from this predicament he's put everybody in. Because Michael right now is probably the best person to do this um Aaron admires Michael so much and she really really wanted to have a good day at lunch with him uh Andy can't make her feel better at this point Angela can't and she's really not close with anybody else in the office so Michael is kind of the guy for the job and he steps up thankfully and fills that role now the future of Andy and Aaron is up for up in the air, we don't know because Aaron says, I think I need some time alone for a while. So we don't really know if she means I'm ending things, we're, we're breaking up because of this, or whether she means right now in this moment, I need to be alone. So that might be something that's revealed in future episodes. Uh, but for now, Secretary's Day is over and Aaron's more or less by herself and Andy's more or less by himself rather than with the secretary. Yeah. They seem more single at this point than they seem together. Right. Uh, We also have this other storyline with Kevin and Gabe. So Oscar turned Kevin uh, into the Cookie Monster. He took an audio recording of Kevin on the phone and paired it with a Cookie Monster video, and it's perfect. So the entire office loves it, except for Kevin, obviously. Gabe is um, taking this video as a chance to show people that he is an authority figure. Now, he really doesn't know how much authority he has, and he uses this to figure that out. So Gabe's had enough. After just two warnings against people making fun of Kevin and, and quoting this video, after just two warnings, he suspends Pam and Jim for two days each without pay. And Dwight, simply for just supporting Gabe and clapping for Gabe. So he's taking this power trip far too far. There's no reason for him to suspend Dwight here, but he does. And in talking with corporate after the fact, I get—I don't know if he's talking to Joe. We don't know for sure. Uh, but he says, oh, so I can't suspend, but I can reprimand? Oh, I can't do either. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, he doesn't have any authority. He's just sort of there as like a corporate liaison, honestly. Like he's a direct connection to corporate and that's it. He doesn't have any power other than that. And so instead of admitting that, that he made a mistake, instead of apologizing himself for trying to impose his will on people when he didn't have the uh, uh, authority to do so, he tries to play like, okay, guys, we had a tough conversation earlier. If If you apologize to me, I will revoke your suspension. That's all it takes. Just a simple apology. We all make mistakes. It's okay, but I will accept your apology if you make one. Well, unbeknownst to him at this point, Pam has gotten word from Toby that Gabe can ask them to leave, ask them not to come into work, but he can't dock their pay. That would not be legal. And so Pam and Jim devise this plan to accept their suspension. And go home for two days <laughs> because they've been suspended and they really need to learn their lesson. And they're not going to do that if they stay at work. They need to go home and learn their lesson. And Gabe just isn't man enough. I'm sorry if that's rude to say. He's not man enough to just say, hey, guys, I was wrong. You need to stay at work. He instead just lets them leave. And that's it. They're gone. They're home. 
gutsy of Jim and Pam to lean into this mistake and just kind of go with it. They learn from Toby that he can't do this. Yeah. So they take that opportunity and they run with it. So they each get two days paid vacation. Yeah. Well, I mean, if anybody gets in trouble here, it's Gabe because he's the one who tried to suspend them in the first place. Dwight does grovel, though, and offer his sincerest apologies. He he says, Gabriel, I apologize. And then he kneels and talks about kissing his hand in contrition and all this kind of stuff. It, It goes way too far. But Dwight's not taking his suspension. Then everyone's pissed up that Jim and Pam got to go home with pay for two days. So Gabe tries to make it up to them by doing the Kevin voice. Not cool when you just suspended two people over that or tried to suspend two people over that. So Kevin mimics Gabe's voice then. That goes over much better. Everyone loves that. And everyone (laughs) takes turns making fun of Gabe saying, ciao, ciao. And being very tall. Um, and that's, Gabe does not like that. But it, yeah, don't do not do the thing that you suspended people for to make people like you. That yeah. bugged me. <laughs> well, he also tries to buy everyone coffee. Like, he, he just completely tries to bribe everybody into winning them over. And then he does a cookie monster when that doesn't work. And then, obviously, that doesn't work either. Well, going into the funny stuff. Uh, We have a cold open that's not really a cold open because it feeds into the rest of the episode. Uh, That's the the initial Cookie Monster video. Everyone thinks it's funny except for Kevin. He says, I don't talk like that. But it's literally his voice. It's literally your voice, Kevin. Of course you talk like that. (laughs) (laughs) It's just a recording of you. Yeah. He even tries to gain sympathy from Angela, who'd sort of be no nonsense about all this kind of stuff. But she is very much enjoying this as well. She's laughing. She says, oh, this is the best day. (laughs) <laughs> and uh i love dwight's this is an amusing link i would like you to send it to me <laughs> no laughter or anything he just says please send it to me it is amusing andy talks about secretary's day he has a very brief talking head where he says if it wasn't for secretaries i wouldn't have a stepmom <laughs> Which has some implications. <laughs> just gonna say. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it, I don't think that's a good thing to celebrate necessarily. No, infidelity. <laughs> um, Implicating anyway. <laughs> right, right. Now Michael, in the car on the way to the restaurant, he says, "I'm kind of a bookworm. Do you mind if we listen to my book?" <laughs> and the, the book is the novelization of the movie Precious based on the book push by sapphire (laughs) so it's a novelization of a movie that's based on a book bookworm and we listen to bits of it and i've never read push but the novelization to me it sounds like is a scene by scene retelling of the movie and it doesn't sound like how a novel is written or whatever type of book push is and so it's just not it doesn't read well, in my uh, uneducated opinion. Um, it's just really funny. <laughs> I just love that whole introduction. This is the novelization yeah. of the movie Precious based on the book Push by Sapphire. <laughs> like, it, it has to be the whole thing. <laughs> so it's either a really bad audiobook of a movie or it is Push by Sapphire. <laughs> These are your two Yeah, options. basically. So there's a bit with Pam's breast pump. She brings it to work and she can't find it. So first, Dwight offers to milk her. No, thank you ever, ever. Meredith, we find, has stolen Pam's breast pump and tries to use it in the bathroom to to pump. It's just very uncomfortable. And that's all I want to say about that. (laughs) (laughs) They go to Hayworth's for lunch. That's the sort of upscale place that Aaron wants to go because it's a special occasion, so we go to a special occasion kind of place. Michael fights it at first, but then Andy insists, uh, just with his eyes, you know, go to Hayworth's. Michael says, okay, to Hayworth's. And what does Michael order at this fancy restaurant? A burger with pickles. And hey, waiter, I only got five or six. I asked for pickles, and I only got like five or six. (laughs) Yes, sir, I'll bring you a bowl of pickles. (laughs) Ugh. No, thank you. I'm not a pickle person, but 
five or six, that'd be way too much. And a bowl full? <laughs> no, thank you. But Plenty. Michael orders a burger at a nice restaurant. This is regarding why Michael told Aaron about Angela. Michael says, you know what? I resent the implication that I would keep that secret. Everyone here knows that I can't and won't keep a secret. (laughs) (laughs) Won't keep a secret. (laughs) They do. They do know that. (laughs) Right before that, he says, and besides, who doesn't tell their girlfriend that they were engaged to someone who works four feet away from them? That's like, that's like Mr. and Mrs. Smith crap. (laughs) 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 And for, for those who may miss the joke, just to be unfunny and explain the joke. That's a movie. Well, it was originally an older movie, but the newest version is Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, which I would bet like a million bucks. That's the one Michael's talking about, uh, where it's a married couple who are both secret agents in separate spy agencies and they're tasked to kill each other. Yeah. So it's sort of like Mr. and Mrs. Smith, but very much not really. (laughs) At the end of the episode, Kevin tries to retaliate and make his own voice dubbed video he sets oscar's voice to the count from sesame street he also is unfunny and and uh explains the joke he says it's funny because oscar's an accountant and he's the count and he counts and he's purple and oscar wears purple everyone's like yeah but that's not his voice he's got a very particular voice michael however thinks it's hilarious of course because (laughs) The Count. I actually quote Michael's line here. Oscar, I am the Count. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's so funny. (laughs) I am the Count. (laughs) Dwight, uh, well, Pam is sort of reacclimating to her desk. She holds up her dead plant and says, you couldn't have watered it to Jim. Jim says, I did not know that existed until this moment. And Dwight speaks up and says, I knew it existed. I just chose to let it die. Pam just says, nice to see you again, Dwight. Hello, Pam. (laughs) 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 One last one for me before I want to highlight just a few Cookie Monster quotes. Uh, (laughs) Kevin, when when Gabe suspends Dwight, Jim, and uh, Pam, Kevin turns to the camera and says, C is for suspension. <laughs> nope. No, it's not. <laughs> oh, nice try, Kevin. <laughs> uh, speaking of Kevin and C being for things, it is for cookies, as in Cookie Monster. Uh, there is Daryl when Kevin is guilt tripped into getting a cookie from him for, quote, Daryl's birthday. I don't know if that's real or not, but. Uh, there's cookies, and as Kevin relents and says, I'm sorry, happy birthday, he takes a bite of the cookie, and Daryl goes, nom, 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 <laughs> <laughs> And later, we've got Kelly in the conference room says, my name is Kevin, I'm an accountant. It's not very good, but Jim then speaks up with his very good one. Michael, can I have an advance on my paycheck because a Mrs. Fields cookie just opened up at the mall? And then, <laughs> sorry, Gay, but that show hasn't been on in many cookies. <laughs> and then lastly, there's the one that gets them suspended from Pam. Hey, Aaron, you look delicious. I mean, beautiful. <laughs> 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 and that's that's the, the highlight reel. Of the Cookie Monster. I'm I'm glad you did that because... I cannot even attempt the voice, so. (laughs) I I don't think mine was very good, but. (laughs) (laughs) You're at least in the right register. Uh, We did have an abundance of deleted scenes for this episode. Uh, Several, several, several. So, first one I want to mention. Dwight hopes that Pam spent her maternity leave wisely and not painting, as he suspects. Pam admits that she did paint a little bit. Dwight, talking head, he says, You should only be able to paint the president, or in a perfect world, the Kaiser. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Dwight and his German nationalism. (laughs) Someone, at some point, left cupcakes on Pam's desk, and she's back now, and it's filled with fruit flies. And then she opens her desk drawer, and this is supposedly unrelated, but Dwight has been breeding maggots. In her desk drawer, which is awful. And no thank you. 
I mean, at least they were <laughs> in a plastic container, and it's not like he was growing them on a piece of meat, but it's still disgusting. Still no. I still have to burn my desk and get out. <laughs> and he, he calls it a double standard. He says, you have a baby and you think it's adorable, but a fly has thousands of babies and you think it's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of rules are these? Michael was going to give Aaron the $15 uh, for Secretary's Day because back when Pam was the receptionist, she convinced Michael that she would rather have the cash value of her half of lunch than go to lunch with Michael. So Michael made her promise to go to Cooper's with that $15 and buy herself a Sunday, And she did. <laughs> and she was year. very excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> but what's interesting about this deleted scene is it changes the context of the episode because the episode makes it seem like Michael's giving Aaron $15 because he's disinterested. But yeah. really there was like a legitimate reason because Pam wanted that and she was secretary or i say secretary receptionist for a long time before this so really michael's not that bad a person for just wanting to give her 15 dollars because that's <laughs> what he thought she might want but anyways and this is a holiday if you will that's been celebrated before it sounds like andy was the one that sort of made this happen mm -hmm. um but this is something that used to be celebrated at least between pam and michael um in the past yeah Erin had a talking head where she talks about just how much she admires michael she says i admire no one as much as i admire michael scott even more than sully sullenberger because while landing the plane in the hudson river michael would have said something funny to make us all feel better and then she tries to come up with an example and she doesn't do it very well and can't but she said, Michael would have done it so good. I can't do it as good as Michael. Erin visited a website in preparation for her lunch with Michael that listed a bunch of conversation starters. She'll use them if there's a lull in the conversation or even if there's not, she says. <laughs> and as we see in the episode, she didn't wait for a lull. She just used them anyway. And they were all very random. The website was also super low quality and had pop-ups that completely blocked the text. <laughs> so you're just yeah, pretty much <laughs> exiting pop-up ads. And in the car, I mean, th these questions really are nonstop. In the car, it's when she finally gets to, where were you on 9-11? Like, where were you on September 11, 2001? And Michael's is like, okay, can I listen to my book now? Because <laughs> for a second, it almost looks like he's about to cry, honestly. Yeah. But... But he's like, yeah, I I'm done with this. And then we get the extended cut of the lunch, and it's just nonstop questions. Like, we get the full uninterrupted by the B-plot uh, cut of the lunch for a, a few minutes at least. And it's just like, she does not stop. She asks a question. Michael says, I don't know, or doesn't answer it otherwise. She answers it, and then goes straight on to the next one. I think my favorite additional one that we got in the deleted scenes was what pizza toppings you would choose. Michael says, meat lovers, sausage lovers, stuffed crust. Aaron says, plain, because I'm plain. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay. That hurts. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to get pizza to match your personality type. <laughs> yeah. You can go nuts. Whatever. Go crazy. <laughs> Aaron's blood sugar is low, is down, because she thought she put a Luna bar in her purse but she accidentally put her remote control in her purse instead. So she just prattles on, and there are no segues. She's, she's so good at being weird. It's so funny. <laughs> I, I, I could just listen to an episode of Ellie Kemper just being Aaron and weirdness and questions all day long. I just think her questions are so funny. <laughs> in the car on the way back, Michael finishes the book. And then he turns to Aaron and says, so when we get back, I think it's a good idea to just not mention this to anybody. It'll be better. It's okay. Just take a couple days, then maybe mention it in private or, or a week or maybe just not mention it at all. <laughs> also, uh, he says, you know, when, when I'm upset, I chew on my seatbelt. And sure enough, he pulls the strap and right in line with his mouth <laughs> is this patch of seatbelt that is worn down because... Worn down because apparently he chews on it. And so he's like suggesting, please <laughs> grab a seatbelt, have a chew. Why not? Uh, have a chew. <laughs> this one, oh, this one was a little sad. Jim, Pam, and Dwight approach Toby about Gabe <laughs> suspending them 
they think it's pretty unfair. And Toby says that's crazy. And he goes on this story about some car wash guy who hates him. The three of them, Jim, Pam, and Dwight, are just standing there like, dude, I don't care. And Toby's completely disappointed when he realizes that they're just there talking to him because Toby's HR. Dwight says, why else would we be here? (laughs) Oh, ow. (laughs) The best part to me is at the beginning, Toby was uh, unraveling a banana like he was about to eat a snack. And then they're, they're just waiting. And he makes a realization, oh, they just want this information from me. And so he like slowly wraps the banana back in its peel, <laughs> just lays it back down. <laughs> it's so sad. <laughs> this next one is not sad. This one is gross. Ryan, oh, yeah. Ryan approaches Aaron sitting by herself in the break room and he has a talking head. He says, you know, people are most willing to be in a three way when in an emotional, vulnerable state. And so he starts talking to Aaron. He says, you know, I'm sorry. I, I, I know how you feel. I love you. Kelly loves you. We both love you. We want to make you feel better in every way. We love you. I love how vulnerable you are right now. And so he's being real creepy, real gross. And then Kelly how comes fragile in. fragile you are. Fragile, that's it is. I said oh, vulnerable. It's fragile. Mm. That's worse. Yeah. Then Kelly comes in, and Kelly's clearly not in on the whole three-way thing, but she's not making things better because she joins in. We love you so much. You need to come over tonight. We're going to fill a watermelon with vodka. We're just going to party, have a good time, blah, blah, blah. And Aaron just says, nope, can't tonight. Sorry. (laughs) And so she leaves, and then Ryan is really clearly upset. He slams his fist on the table. He turns to Kelly and says, yeah, I can't do tonight either. I got something. (laughs) Really? Because you could a second ago. Yeah. Ryan was just really into the idea of this possibly happening. And now that it's not, nope, don't want to be with you, Kelly. So much for the cute moment in the last episode. Yeah, right. I have to give Erin credit because I didn't think that she would be like in tune enough to realize what he was insinuating. Mm-hmm. Though I'm, I'm proud of her for not walking into an uncomfortable situation. <laughs> yeah. There's a Pam and Jim talking head. Pam says that her first day back to work was better than she expected. (laughs) Uh, Jim kind of prompts her and she does the Kevin cookie monster voice and Jim just cracks up and he's just, he's just so happy to have his wife back in, in her desk next, next to him. Me want suspension every day. (laughs) Michael, Michael, the desks are made of cookies. (laughs) (laughs) Good first day back when you get to go right back home. Yeah, no kidding. For two days with pay. Chad, you've got our discussion topic for this episode. Okay. Why do you think Aaron's reaction to the Angela news is so intense? She says to Andy later that trust is the most important thing to her. Does that come from the foster lifestyle, maybe? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. But... We sort of saw something similar to this back in season three when Karen first found, about, found out about Jim and his crush on Pam, but she didn't even react this strongly. Granted, that wasn't an engagement, but still, what do you think? It's so funny that you said that because I put in my notes that we talked about this in our bonus episode about Karen. My first instinct is a is painting with a very large brush and is a huge generalization. And I'm sorry if I step on any toes here, but I think given her oddness and her just general, um, she's got some breaches in maturity and knowledge. I think that her experience growing up in foster care was probably very fragmented. And so she just didn't get a good grasp on lots of um, adult feelings and emotions and that that kind of has to do with this um that's again a large brush but that's that's my first instinct only because we see so many of her oddities in this episode as well that do seem to be due to foster care yeah i i think that's a large part of it is some sort of i don't want to say mental illness but it 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 is a lapse in maturity, I think, and just not having that experience prior mm-hmm. to being with Andy, really. Connecting it with Jim and Karen, it's 
to me, I think that this is more of a disclosable thing than Jim having to disclose disclose to Karen his relationship with Pam because that wasn't ever a real relationship in a sense with Jim and Pam. Whereas here, Andy absolutely should tell Aaron, hey, listen, Angela and I had a thing. It lasted a while. We were engaged. It's over now. But the difference here is I think that it's still a little too early for it to be a real expectation for like normal adults to have disclosed that heavy of a piece of information this soon. Like, are you, and maybe you are, but I'm just asking, are you supposed to disclose on the first date? Hey, by the way, I was engaged to the person who sits behind you. Like, is that like a first date conversation or even a second or third date? I would argue, no, it's been three weeks, but yes, that is a piece of information that Andy owes her. It just sucks that Michael let it loose so soon. I think it should be right around now. I would agree that it's not a first date thing because if I was dating some guy and on my first date with him, he was like, oh, by the way, I was engaged to this woman. I would think he was still caught on to her. I thought he would still like had feelings for her if he mentioned her on the first date, you know, like this mm-hmm. isn't, Yeah, it just wouldn't be the time to talk about it. Um, I think three weeks in, I mean, he definitely needs to say something in soon because they share a workspace and people being who they are, are going to be nosy and are going to say something as evidenced by, by Michael. So maybe Michael assumed that Aaron already knew there's no good time to tell your new girlfriend that you were engaged to somebody who sits behind her. But yeah. I think bottom line is Aaron overreacted for it being so soon in the relationship. Andy definitely owed her this information, but again, I think it's too soon in the relationship. Yeah. Or it was getting closer to that time, but it's Michael's fault that it was such a big deal because he let it loose at a time where neither of them were ready for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So that is the end of our official 65th episode of An American Workplace. You can contact us at facebook.com slash workplace pod or at workplace pod on Twitter. You can rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts if you care to do so. And you can email feedback and ideas to workplacepod at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at ktlady623 or at facebook.com slash katie.white. The best place for me is at chadadada on Twitter. That is C-H-A-D-A-D-A-D-A. Also, facebook.com slash chad.hopkins and my other podcast, Cinescope, where you can find on thecinescopepodcast.com and where other podcasts can be found. Show notes and all contact information for this show can be found at workplacepodcast.com. We have a few shout outs to give to our new patrons on Patreon. There is Aaron, Sierra, and Sapphire. Thank you all so much for joining us on Patreon. Uh, If you want a shout out and more of an American workplace each week, including access to our discussion outline and notes, a logo sticker, bonus episodes, and live streams, check out our Patreon page and pick the support level that you think is worth it at patreon.com slash workplace pod. And that's all for this week. Thank you for joining us to watch one of our favorite shows, The Office, here on episode 65 of An American Workplace. Make sure to join us in episode 66 for our discussion on the next two episodes of season six, Body Language and The Cover-Up. Bye! Real quick, before I get to my discussion topic and before I forget, there were a couple of mentions of the Scranton Strangler across these two episodes. Uh, I only wanted to mention it because we mentioned it before when it was first mentioned in the delivery. So uh, the first mention was in uh, Happy Hour when Dwight and Isabel were in the parking lot talking. And Dwight was talking about defending against the the Strangler, you know, the whole Phantom of the Opera, hand at the level of your eyes thing. Uh, and wanting a chance at him, blah, blah, blah. And I think there was, yeah, there was one more in a deleted, oh, we didn't talk deleted scenes from the first episode. Did we not? Oh my gosh. Oh, we totally skipped that. Do you want to go through them real quick? Yeah. Oops. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay, deleted scenes for this episode. (laughs) We're a (laughs) mess. Okay.
And fast forward. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, Gabe, but that show hasn't been on in many cookies. 